Interviews can be daunting, but they don't have to be if you're well prepared. In this video, I'm gonna go through the top 10 iOS developer interview questions and not only go through them and solve, but actually uh, we'll dive deep into the reasoning behind the answers and probably look into some documentation as well as look at some sample apps and sample code. And to assist me to make it look like a real mock interview, uh, my friend Daniel will be helping. Uh, he's on the other side of the call and uh, Dan, say hi. Hey, what's up everyone? So yeah, the first question would be to you actually. And uh, uh, could you tell me more about yourself? Yeah, so hey everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a web front-end developer working mostly with React. And I did iOS like five years ago for a little bit. So I am a bit familiar with the questions so I can assist Richard with the interview. So you'll be my interviewer now. Uh, yeah, basically, so you've seen the uh, question list. What do you think of them so far? Um, yeah, it's like nothing has changed much. I'm just wondering why you didn't add any Swift UI or combined questions. Yeah, I think um, it's a good idea. I think uh, Swift UI and Combine are such are new topics and uh, they really worth a separate video on that uh, on that topic. So probably we'll make a separate one and not to miss it, just make sure to subscribe to my channel and uh, if you want the Combine and Swift UI uh, separate video, just let me know in the comments below. I'll make one just on that topic. Uh, yeah. Uh, but why I started with those questions, basically they are very fundamental and all the companies right now are asking some sort of them uh, when interviewing for an iOS developer role. And um, uh, this is really interesting because uh, if you watch this video till the end, uh, there are about 10 questions, uh, it's very likely that you'll get one or two of them in your next interview. So uh, I think that's a very good... Uh, uh, training and exercise for for preparation for interview. All right, yeah. So let's get started. Yeah, let's go. So I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. So the first question is: Can you explain me what is a view control lifecycle and what are the most important events? Uh, yeah, I think this is basically the classic iOS interview question is being asked for 10 years at least. So uh, to actually see what is the view controller life cycle is, I've just created this um, uh, basic app, which is printing out uh, each method so that we can see what's going on in the view controller while we show it or hide it. So I used the storyboard uh, and uh, created a very, very simple app, which will show just the uh, model view controller, basically presenting a sheet from the bottom and we'll see what events we'll be printing out. Let's run this app and see for ourselves and uh, what our lifecycle events and what are, uh, what are uh, the most important ones. So open lifecycle, press the button and we start with a view controller. So as you can see, the first one to be called is init with coder, which is basically an initializer and uh, in that case it might be called a different one in some cases because for example if you're uh, initializing your uh, view controller programmatically in it with frame will be called or this one in it with nib name or nail so one of those basically the initializer is always going the first the next one is load view which is um, a method when uh, asking for a view to be loaded and the view that load uh, follows it immediately. Basically, once the view is loaded, you get the view that load event. Uh, I don't understand why load view if needed is called after that. Probably it's some sort of legacy uh, artifact because it does make a lot of sense. Maybe it's just to ensure that the view is loaded, but in, at this stage it does nothing. And then we have the so-called uh, uh, appearance and layout uh, events. So view will appear, it's called before the view appears on screen, and the view will layout sub is called uh, before the layout pass and then after the layout has been completed, uh, we have the view did layout sub -use. All of those are available to be overridden. 
And um, yeah, and once the view is about to appear, once, once the view already appeared, you have the view did appear. And once I drag it down, we have them in the reverse. So we have the view will disappear, and view did disappear, and the D in it is called last. Uh, in case you don't see D in it for some reason in your view controller, that means that you have a memory leak and it's still in the memory. So you have to uh, work with the memory profiler. And uh, one more important thing is that if we clear the console, that this view will appear and view did appear as well as view did disappear might be called multiple times. So if I try to dismiss the view, for example, and then I'll decide to pull it back, I have the view will disappear, uh, but I never see the view did disappear because it's still on the screen and we are going back, view will appear and view did appear. So uh, Apple actually has a very nice, a very nice um, a sample for that, it has a very nice chart. I'll link it, uh, I'll link it in the description for sure. And um, understanding this chart is really crucial to understanding the view control life cycle. So, uh, you basically have four states, uh, appeared and disappeared, and transitions between them into multiple directions. So, uh, and what's important, you can move to appearing state you, and immediately move to disappearing state or vice versa. This is usually emitted by all of the uh, candidates and they just think it's one time event and uh, this is a big mistake. So these events might be called multiple times in the life cycle of the view controller, as we've seen. Uh, and of course, the one when rotation is happening is the view will uh, transition to uh, size with coordinator. And the same is uh, called when, uh, for example, you're on an iPad and trying to resize the, uh, resize the view controller on a multitasking screen. So I think that's it regarding the uh, view controller events. So Hopefully you're satisfied with this question. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that there are that many methods around the like the view control life cycle. So it's also new to me. But what do you think? What are the most important ones to remember? Because the, there are quite many. And yeah. Which ones? Yeah. To summarize, to summarize, really, it's uh, it's all about grouping them into categories. The first one is the initializer. That's the main one. That's the first one. The initializer is the first and then the de-initializer is the last. Okay. Then you have the view loading related callbacks. Load view if needed, load view and view did load. Those are the next step. And they are yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But what, which ones are the most important like which ones I guess I think are I think I think the, I think the load view and view did load so view did load is probably the most used one I think if you create a template yeah. right now it will be there it will be included there yeah uh, and, uh, and what's the difference between load view and view did load um load uh, so basically load view is uh, so they are going in a very specific order, right? So you have the load view first and then view the load after that. It's pretty clear. Okay. And load view is the one to override if you want to use a custom view. For example, if you want to have view equals UI table view. Let's see how it works. Like I'll, I'll, I'll make just this change and let's see if uh, I will have a different view there. I mean, I should. Uh, life cycle button. It looks like, look, is it a table view actually? No, because probably I'm using the storyboard. That's why it won't really, uh, it won't really plug it in. So I don't know. But uh, if I were to use, uh, if I were to use, um, where is this? Dimming view drop shadow. Can't see, anyway. Life cycle. You actually UI table view. You see, it's here. Pretty cool. Oh yeah. So, yeah. So it's there. So yeah, load view is what you use to uh, connect your custom view uh, and overwrite the default. But if you don't do anything, it basically adds a UI view here, like that, and you just can ignore it. 
You usually don't need oh, it to okay. override. And view that load is when the view is loaded and you can do some customizations, for example, adding in sub view or something else. So, uh, that's why I kind of prefer to group them by the purpose instead of like selecting the most important ones. Mm, oh, and nice. then we have this appearance callbacks, view will appear, view did appear, uh, and view will disappear, view did disappear. So regarding the presentation, appearance, disappearance. And we can uh, add uh, a third class, which is to layout, related to the layout, transitioning to sizes and so forth. So yeah, uh, initializer, deinitializer, uh, view loading, uh, presentation, and um, uh, layout. And I didn't even go into details like, for example, things like um, did receive memory warning, that's another one, uh, or will add, uh, or sorry, add child view controller, did add, will move to parent view controller. So there are a lot of callbacks to you think about like apart from those, but basically view controller is a, it's a very important class. Obviously there are a lot of uh, connection points to work with. So those I've listed are the main. And of course this project is available on GitHub. So uh, make sure to play with it. I think the best way to learn about the view control lifecycle is basically open the project and go through each of those uh, steps individually and understand how, how it behaves and, um, instead of like just reading documentation. Yeah, so okay. hopefully we can move to the next one. Yeah, let's go to the next one. So uh, I think this is the most common one. Which one? What's the difference between a struct and a class? Yeah, it's a very common one though. So, um, uh, well, let yeah. me try to answer it. Yeah, Do you uh, want yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What do you think? Uh, at least I remember something about it. So, uh, I think the class is reference is reference based and struct is value based. Value based. So, what does what does it mean in practice? Like in practice, it's like when you create an instance, you get like, I guess, a pointer to it if it's a class. And if you create an instance of a struct, then you get a, like the value instead. So. Yeah, but what, what, what if you try to modify uh, the same class, like will it modify at the other sites which holding that reference or not, if it's with class? And what do you mean if there's going to be another Like, class? for example, if you pass class to multiple objects and then you modify uh, something like a value at that class, for example, let's say point uh, of the player, will it be reflected for each object to own that class or uh, will they act like independently? Yeah, I think it's going to be like a singleton. Yeah, well, that's... yeah, it will be reflected for all. Yeah, that's 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 the main. It's called reference uh, based. But yeah, a lot of but but uh, a lot of people are uh, going into details like, for example, uh, saying that uh, struct is always copied when you pass it, or saying that you like something details like. Uh, oh, you cannot uh, you cannot extend the struct. You cannot subclass struct, but you can subclass a class, right? But those are uh, the problem with those answers that they are not very uh, they they don't always hold true. For example, you can uh, you cannot subclass a final class, right? And uh, you can uh, extend the struct using a protocol. And uh, the most important thing, which usually all the people are uh, not aware of is that um, the struct might be passed by reference to and uh, for example all of the uh, collections in the standard library like dictionary arrays and so forth strings sets they use the optimizations to reduce uh, the cost of coping so um, if you try to, to pass the array it will be actually under the hood pa passed by reference uh, and only when you modify it will actually duplicate the whole array, which is an interesting uh, idea to know like for iOS developer uh, when profiling for performance problems. And uh, if you look at the 
iOS uh, or actually Swift um, array code, you will see that there is like a buffer which is uh, used like internal storage for an array. And when you try to copy that, a lot of uh, functions are actually a lot of functions are actually passed to um, they are passed to uh, to this buffer. And uh, there are a lot of optimizations, for example, like mutations uh, for copying and so forth, um, simply because, uh, because it has to be faster uh, for those optimizations. And this is doing the job of making it run fast. And uh, from, from the developer's perspective, it appears as if the array is copied immediately, but in fact, it's doing this copy and write on the host so because Swift is such an optimized language and a lot of complexity is hidden from the developer. So yeah, my answer would be that uh, classes appear to be passed by reference, have the reference semantics and uh, structs are appearing like they are passed by value, so basically copied, but they just appear like that. Those are only the semantics. Do not make assumptions of what's going on under the hood. And I'll link those nice articles from Apple which describe the uh, difference more like in practice. It's important to understand those, uh, those uh, differences. But basically, yeah, the main one is the value versus uh, like having an independent instance or uh, in case of uh, struct or having the same instance shared, shared memory in case of a class. And uh, yeah, of course you can have the identity. Um, hey Richard, do you have like an analogy how to compare a class and a struct? Like, yeah, yeah, really I think, yeah, I think the class is more like a bank account. So whenever you deposit something to it and withdraw, uh, it refers back to the same bank account. So let's say I put a thousand there, I have a thousand. I withdraw a thousand, I have zero, right? But uh, a struct would be like more like a bank statement. Uh, so I have the bank statement for, from today, which shows thousand. I can get the same from tomorrow, which will be zero. And uh, I can copy, I can remove it, uh, I can pass it to someone else. There will be no, uh, it will be like a different copy basically. So independent of my bank account, independent of everything. So I think that would be the best analogy. Okay, nice. So, 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 so uh, that's sort of the benefit why using structs might be a good idea because uh, you can pass them between threads because basically it's copied. So you are not afraid of any sort of race conditions, mutations, because uh, once you pass it to a different thread, it, the struct lives on its own and the class will still have that reference. And that's sort of the notion why they wanted to get rid of classes uh, as much as possible and move into structs and move this Oracle oriented programming thing. I think that was the idea. Cool. Should we move to the next one? Yeah, let's go ahead. So what's the difference between frame and bonds property or view? Uh, I think it's important to figure out what, what they are similar. I have again a sample app here that will help us to figure out what they are and what they are not. So um, first of all, uh, let's go to check uh, the UI view class. So we can just take a look at it. And we have the frame here. And we have actually both frame and bounds. And this, you can see they are both of type C direct, which means they are essentially the same uh, type. And you can set one for another. So that really makes them similar. Uh, but what's different is their semantic and the way they apply to, the way they used to. And this is the most important thing, uh, the most important difference. And uh, in short, it boils down to, uh, if I launch the app, uh, I'll just launch the app. So uh, the frame is about the, um, they, they both, if we zoom in here, like if we go into the uh, C direct, they both have the origin, which is the starting point and the size, which is basically the size of the rectangle. So uh, they, uh, they uh, the difference is that in case of frame, the origin points to the 
uh, position in its super view. So if the view is not added to a super view, there is no concept of frame, right? And the size is, well, it's clear. It's the size which it occupies in the super view. This is one of the important things we will get back soon. Uh, and with the rect, with the, with the bounds, it's slightly different concept. So uh, the origin is, relates to the content that the view is showing. So what piece of the content the view is showing uh, in its frame? And the size is basically the size of that viewport, let's call it like that. So uh, to sum it up, uh, the uh, frame is about position of the view, so size and uh, origin in relation to its super view. And the bounds, it's the uh, mm, what portion of the content the view is showing. And uh, I'll have a few examples to demonstrate this a bit further. So uh, first one is the scroll view. The white one is the scroll view and we have two views there, which are sort of showing how the view scrolls itself. And I'll try to drag it now a bit. So see how the bounds and the frame are changing. So as you can see, there is a frame and bounds and I'll try to drag it to different directions. As you can see, if you, if you can take close attention, uh, pay close attention to the frame, uh, the frame is actually always the same here. Uh, it never changes. So whenever I drag it, no matter, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the bounds of the scroll are actually changing all the time in both directions. So uh, the size stays the same, 350 and 241 is the same here and here because the scroll view size doesn't change and the content size doesn't change, right? Uh, but uh, the origin is changing. So uh, that's how the scroll view scrolls and, and decides what piece of content to display. And one more thing, of course, we have the case when the size of the scroll view bounds also changes. And that's when you have, uh, for example, pinch to zoom gesture. Uh, then you will have your size increasing and uh, uh, scroll you will basically zoom onto something. And then there is another uh, demo which I've prepared is more interesting probably, it's rotation. So the red rectangle is showing the frame and the purple is showing the bounds. Now I'll rotate it a bit. As you can see, the area which, which this purple rectangle is occupying in its parent super view, it has to be rectangular. It's growing once I rotate it but the content stays the same basically, right? And if we take a look what's going on under the hood, is we'll get the same answer. So the bounds always stay the same, it's 100, 100 here, uh, but it's the frame that changes. And the, as you can see, the numbers are very, very complex here. And yeah, because we are just rotating uh, and if we go to the official documentation, we see that the if the transform property is not the identity transform, the value of this property is undefined of the frame property. So it to be ignored. But in this case, it actually makes sense, I think, because you can see the uh, frame of this view is larger, right? So uh, it occupies a larger part of the parent view. So yeah, now I'll briefly show the code which I wrote here. Uh, it's nothing fancy, just uh, regular mm, regular view controller and uh, when rotation is being detected I just rotate it on the same uh, level as the uh, as the actual uh, as the actual uh, pinch gesture or rotate gesture all right that was a pretty deep answer yeah I mean I mean, I mean yeah, it's not like an interview question and answer. It's more like a bit more explanation. So yeah, uh, to sum up, the f the frame, the frame of the view, it's what it occupies in relation to its parent view, to its super view. No super view, no frame. And bounds is how it positions its content in its own, let's say, canvas. So that's to be the summary. Mm. So the bonds are always larger than the frame? The bounds are always larger than the frame. 
I actually don't know. I mean, could be that the balance will be smaller than the frame. Well, let's see. Well, may actually, no, there is a thing called clips to bounce, you know, right? So if you, uh, you, can, you can clip to bounce, probably some of the subviews might extend to the bounce, right? Uh, and mm. they will still be drawn. But if you set clip to bounce, property to true, then it will limit to this bounce. So yeah, the bounds, uh, the bounds can be, uh, so the content might extend slightly further. Uh, than the bounds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one. Yeah, so let's go. What is, what is protocol-oriented programming? Uh, yeah, so protocol-oriented programming is a new, or not so new paradigm, which was introduced to Swift. And the main idea was to differentiate from object-oriented programming and to uh, solve those problems that were introduced with object-oriented programming. And I have actually a keynote, a presentation uh, about the type system of Swift. Actually, I'll link the video as well. And in short, if uh, the, the Swift has a very strong, very strong protocol system. So um, you can have the classes, structs, and enums conform to protocols, and the protocols can have the inheritance between them. So there is a very, very flexible way to uh, define relationship. And uh, if I compare the Objective-C, the object-oriented language with Swift, the way this relationship power can be expressed with protocols. In Objective-C, you have the, uh, for example, NS number. Uh, uh, NS number subclassing, uh, is, is a subclass of NS value, and which in turn is NS object. So, for example, the, there is such peculiar, peculiar Peculiar. Uh, so there are such um, issues that you could compare the view controller with uh, an S number, for example, if this number is equal to the view controller, which does make a lot of sense, and um, uh, be because they are the uh, the descendants of the same class, and in Swift they fixed it by using a protocol. Basically, a protocol that can ensure that. Um, that the compared values are of the same time. So the protocol-oriented programming is the idea that you can detach the relationships of between uh, of, of the objects from the objects themselves. And if an object uh, satisfies some sort of uh, constraints, some sort of rules, uh, then you can embed this whole object into a relationship without writing too much code and like repeating it yourself over and over again for each. Uh, different kind of object, uh, and uh, basically that's a the, the idea of protocol oriented programming is separating the uh, hierarchy of relationship of interrelationship and hierarchy of objects of methods, uh, and that's a pretty powerful construct. For example, you have a lot of power in in the thing called retroactive modeling. Like you have, for example, the equatable protocol, and the way. Uh, the equal sign is defined, the equality operator, and the inequality operator is defined as the, uh, the opposite of, uh, of equality operator, so pretty cool. And you can compose the protocol so uh, you can work on a very, very high level without touching the concrete types uh, and um, develop software in a much, much more uh, modular and flexible way. And uh, yeah, so it's focused on the types and relationship between them. Uh, and if you have a new type created, you can quickly embed it into an existing relationship uh, between them and uh, basically uh, use all the power that you've already developed uh, to have new types supported immediately. And I think the biggest analogy for me is um, using some sort of algorithm to capture the list of, uh, to capture the photos of the tallest buildings by using the map of the city and the list of those buildings. So you have to have a map and you have to have a list to go through each of those buildings and take a picture. The only thing that you have to care about is that your uh, map and your list are of the same city, then you'll get the proper pictures, right? So the protocol 
um, protocol expresses this whole algorithm without naming the city. Once you have a New York, for example, here, you can make the same for Barcelona, or you can make the same for, let's say, Los Angeles. You can have the same uh, set of photos taken simply by having these two um, objects. And uh, I guess that's the idea of it. What do you think? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I see protocols are like kind of like interfaces. So I don't really remember that much of it. But your answer was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the most important difference, because we have the interfaces in Objective-C, uh, okay. the, most, the most important difference uh, in Swift is that you can actually uh, work only with protocols. You can combine them. You can uh, express more, uh, more flexible relationship, more concrete relationship uh, and, uh, between objects. And that will give you uh, let's say more compiler support in what, while you develop, so you don't have to typecast as much uh, because protocol already constrains that thing, that type to a specific uh, subtype, and you know that it will be of that specific type and so forth. So you uh, are getting a lot of type safety, uh, and uh, but but at the same time you have a lot of flexibility, which in the object-oriented languages like uh, Objective C was. Uh, what was uh, implemented with the dynamic dispatch dynamism and so forth. And that's why you could compare like a UI view controller with a number or whatever. Of course, it will return a false, but uh, you still can do that. And in Swift, it will just throw an error. All right. It, 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 it will not even compile, I mean. All right. Okay, but let's move on. So. Yep. Grand Central Dispatch. Yeah, and so the question. Yeah, let's let's try to open the so, playground. Yeah, let's yeah, talk it's a nice about one. That one. Yeah, I like this question quite a lot. So uh, I guess uh, the task is to figure out what will be printed out in all of those questions. Let's start with the first one, right? Do you want to try to solve it? I mean, when I look at that code, uh, it's like uh, who who writes this kind of code? Yeah. By, by the way, by the way, before we, uh, me write this code for sure, it's it's I written this code a few <laughs> half an hour ago. But before we start with that, I I, I highly recommend watching this protocol oriented programming talk by Apple uh, in 2015 down with Apple DC, and I'll link it of course. So um, it's more entertaining probably than this video, but <laughs> it definitely takes a longer time to understand. So uh, yeah, let's get back to this question. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think the first thing to say in an interview, in my opinion, when you see this, is that this code should not really be written. And if you have, if you see this code, the best thing is to go back to the drawing board, figure out what should it do, and uh, and uh, then. Uh, write it from scratch by understanding the requirements. But uh, that's the first thing. And if, for example, if you were to be interviewed by me, you'd get definitely some bonus points for that. And uh, yeah, but what do you think, uh, what do you think uh, the answer is here? Um, so defer does things as the last, stuff and <laughs> um so the print f is going to execute first this one yeah yeah let's try and um yeah so yeah, yeah I, so i, I think we, uh, I think the the next one is going to be the print e because I think yep. the defer goes in the reverse order. Yeah, so they like, go, this is a very important thing to remember. They go in the reverse order. So uh, if this defer is called first, it will be executed last. 
And the deferred staging, what, uh, for those who don't know this, it's basically a, a way to work with a legacy API, for example, if you have some, some resource acquisition happening here and you want to clean it up immediately instead of remembering to clean up in all those if cases you have in the code, you basically write, as soon as you lock onto something, you write a defer statement immediately, and you'll sure that the moment the function is closed, that resource will be closed too, basically, yeah. So uh, then this one is obviously to be the next one. Which one is the next after E? Yeah, so it's gonna be the one above it, so the where the print B is. Yeah, and, and in my in my opinion, just do this. So um, whenever whenever you have something complex, just hide it here with the um, with the uh, code folding, and um, then you can unfold those ribbons. So you see the F help make Xcode help you. Then you unfold this one, which is the next one, right? Makes it really clear. E. Then we unfold this one, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Because we, we go one level up. And uh, what is the order here? So it's going to print B, the first one. B, because it's the, yeah, the B, or running the B here. Yeah, the, then it's going to go to the print D. D because the defer statement is deferred, right? We just hide it. Yeah, it's going to be excuse yeah, yeah. or flashed. Then D, and then we have C because uh, we are exiting this whole close, right? Yeah. And this is the last one. E. Oh yeah, let's check this out. I think I agree with you. F E B D C A. F E B D C A. Looks like we are correct. Cool. Yeah, cool. Let's let's uh, let's tackle the next one, which is a bit more complex. And again, the idea is that this code should not go into the real system, into the real application. So uh, it's better to refactor it than trying to decipher and understand. So what would be your so actually, uh, approach? So actually, how would you refactor a code like that? Uh, yeah, uh, well, well, it's a synthetic code, so like I, I don't know the purpose. I'll go back and oh, look okay. at the look at the look what this code is doing, and then try to restructure it. But yeah, we can actually. This is a good help. Um, in the preferences, you can actually set up the code uh, uh, in a text editing. You have the code folding ribbon here, which will add you this ability to fold the code and. This is really convenient to solve this kind of tasks. That this actually asks quite a lot in the interview for some reason. Uh, so yeah, just fold the ribbons and you can focus on uh, what to be executed first. So yeah, how would you tackle this question? Yeah, so dispatch queue. Let's go. So the first one that's going to print it is the A. A because it's the first in the. Uh, yeah, it just yeah, yeah. first line of code. Then this dispatch queue line gets executed, so it like creates a new queue. Yep. And, and and it, doesn't, it, one, doesn't, it doesn't create a new queue, it just dispatches to a different queue, right? Oh yeah. Well yeah, yeah. lower level stuff. <laughs> yeah, well well uh, yeah, sure. But uh, <laughs> it's it's an async, uh, it's an async queue, right? So, uh, this oh, is yeah, 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 that's true. It's in the sync one. So, okay, well, yeah, so it's, it's in sync. It's gonna, like, I guess, go through this function first. So, it's gonna the whole thing, print the, yeah. So, yeah, correct. Gonna, like, we can just hide it because it's the async, right? So, it's a separate queue. We just hide it, yeah. So, yeah, the i is gonna be next, correct. And what else? So we now need to look here, right? Yeah, so then it's going to check out the, the async queue and it's going to print the B. All right, pretty clear. I don't think I have any concerns regarding that. Okay, and then there's the async queue, so it's going to like... Yeah. Skip this? Well, put it on another queue, I yep. guess. So we are hiding and, this for now? Yeah, so it's going to go to the D. 
D, D. D, right? Yeah, and then, uh, okay, so there's a sync, not async, but yeah, a sync. sync, synchronous. Yeah, and so they are in the same queue, right? The, the, the main queue, queue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. So first of all, what what is the sync doing to the queue? What, what is the purpose of the sync? How is it different from this? Like you have two of those. Um, you have the async here and you have sync. What's the difference between yeah, this think, and this? I think it's going to block the UI until the print E gets executed. Well, well it, it, it won't block the UI. It will it will block the execution. So basically, uh, oh, okay. you you go the B, then you go to D. This is scheduled, right? This is async. It just skips it. Then you have D and then it goes to this line and then it waits. Basically, it, it schedules this part to be executed on the main queue again but it will wait until this finishes. And while it waits, uh, it ha the main queue has, uh, there is one more important difference. Uh, there are serial and parallel queues, right? So we know that main queue is serial queue, so uh, it will execute the tasks in the order that we send to it. So it will not start executing this task before it will start uh, it will finish this one. So the C will be finished first and then only it will go to E, right? Oh, for me. Yep, Beca because it is serial queue, so it will uh, take task by task. So it will not uh, execute them in parallel. So it will not be able to, there will be no race condition between the C and the E. So this is very important. Yeah. So even though there's an async like, method, or like yeah, it, it it is it is as it is async, right? But you see, it's yeah. it's been async in relation to this global queue, uh, but on, but then it sends it on the main queue, and uh, and uh, it is scheduled there, so uh, the task has been put to that queue, right? Now you go next to the you printing D, and now the sync is again with relation to this queue, basically waiting synchronously while this whole thing executes on the e, uh, on the main queue. And uh, you're waiting, 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 but uh, it takes the first task, which is C, it prints C, and then it will print E. Okay. Because, yeah, and then it will skip for them. So, uh, actually, I'm interested, I'm, 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 I'm interested, yeah, I think it will block the queue, right? So the, the H is still here, so it will not reach it, right? So this should be, yeah. So then again, we're having the async thing, right? Yeah. So we are <laughs> so, so we so we are skipping this, right? Yeah. So H is going to be next. H. Let's see. I'm I'm not even sure myself, but uh, but I would agree with you. It's H. And now it's time to unwind the async. Yeah. So then it's going to be F. F. Right. H I is already here. So F. How about G? Well, yeah, I guess that's the only thing left. I think it won't be uh, printed out. For real, right. Yeah, look at look at this. Look at this. So we have the we have the dispatch queue uh, main async. So basically, dispatch tasks and move on. Dispatch the task and move on. So the H is here. So dispatch the task and move on. Uh, but then inside that task queue again, uh, scheduling a next task. To be executed synchronously, right? Just in front of your current task, because this one is still haven't finished. Remember, the main queue is the synchronous queue. It's oh, sorry, it's a serial queue. It takes one task after another. So until it finishes executing this task, it can start doing this one. So uh, and, bec and because it never finishes this one, because it waits for this forever, this is called a deadlock. So basically, the G will never be printed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, that's my opinion. Let's take a look. Uh, this is not an easy task, I'll say, but uh, let's see what will be in practice. And how? So A I B D C E H C E H F, and the, as you can see, the G is not printed, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. just zoom in on this one. Yeah, really interesting. So, 
Uh, these are actually uh, the questions are asked in the interviews, like uh, some of the variations of them. You might get a different one. You can get the guard let question, not necessarily <laughs> defer or not necessarily dispatch, but the idea is the same. It's some sort of spaghetti code. Uh, I, I wouldn't call it something else. And, um, <laughs> and, and they're trying to trick you into uh, making a mistake with the understanding of those intricacies, let's say, like that. This is actually very mm. high-level questions, very high-complexity high, high complexity questions. So, yeah, how was that for you? Yeah, it was quite difficult. Yeah, the, last, but... the last one definitely is a bit more complex than the first one. And mm. I think because this tests so much, uh, you need to learn about the synchronous versus asynchronous scheduling. You need to uh, learn about the deadlock and serial and parallel queues. So there is a lot of things to to uh, to dissect in this question in a way, even if it's it looks so simple. And uh, and the the diff difficult part is that it's actually quite easy to mistake the sync from async. It looks almost the same. Like there is one letter difference, and you just can like um, make a mistake by not looking. Uh, well enough, let's say. Yeah, and I think it's quite important to make the code readable also for others. Yeah, yeah. So that you know, like if the guy leaves the company, the other one comes in. And can, I like, think I think continue. I think this code is unreadable. If we have to spend like ten minutes, and if it's asked in the interview, it's definitely unreadable. But it's a yeah, good thing to it's a good thing to uh, mention that, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. But okay, let's go to the next one. So yeah, let's go. Um, could you explain what is MVC architecture and what are their main components? Uh, yeah, so the MVC architecture is actually pretty old. And the best way to learn about it is to uh, read about the Apple's document. And I believe it's actually a retired document, so it's not supported anymore. Uh, so there are plenty of materials. If you, um, there are plenty of materials, but the gist of it is that you have a separate classes for uh, each of your uh, components, let's call it like that. You have the model, which is defining the uh, data layer and the logic of the app. Uh, you have the view, which is uh, responsible for the uh, presentation and for the uh, user input controls. And the controller is actually linking those together. For example, user presses the button, the controller gets that signal, gets that event, and then it does something to the model. Uh, and the model somehow um, doing some job and then it notifies the controller about the changes. So basically that's the idea of structuring the app in a way. Okay. In, 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 in iOS, of course, you have the view and the controller really, really closely tied together so that they are view controller, uh, basically a very, very, uh, let's say, uh, sandwiched approach. And the model is usually, uh, might be different because it might be a core data model, it can be a remote model on the server or something else. But um, yeah, this is usually the architecture of the UI kit iOS applications. So is the controller only used for UI or could it be used for like data fetching and stuff like that? Um, no, not really. I think if I, uh, the first which I remember is actually the fetch results controller. I don't know why I'm looking at the Objective C, but I think that there is a Swift version of it. So um, of course, so the fetch results controller is basically uh, having a fetch request to core data, basically responsible to preparing the data to be displayed to the table view. So you have like a table view controller, fetch results controller, and you combine them together and you basically got your data presenting, showing up in the table view. And that's more like the idea of this model view controller approach to have the modularity uh, that you have the building blocks and you combine them together and uh, you have the ready ready making like ready working app and um, fetch results controller doesn't have any ui classes in its import declarations because it's just a it's just a 
uh, modal controller is called like that. And then there is a UI document, which is doing the same job essentially. Uh, modal layer, modal controller layer for uh, uh, reading and writing documents for the um, both Mac and iOS. So not necessarily. Uh, UI view controller is the most known one, and but uh, it's not necessarily that you have. Oh. Yeah, 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 you can have the combining roles, like for example, uh, both controller and view roles. This is a view controller. And then there is model controller. So definitely, you can have a different. As you can see, there is like a different controller uh, objects, and there is not necessarily like a. It's not necessarily controls the view. And the model, there might be it, it. The controller can connect together different pieces. It can connect, for example, multiple controllers, like a navigation controller, for example. It doesn't operate on the view level; it mainly operates on the controller level. All right. So, how about like when you have modern apps? They combine a lot of different content on a single screen. How would you kind of how would you tackle that? Are you going to have like many view controllers? Like, yeah. Yeah, I think I'll do that. So I'll just, uh, uh, instead of putting everything into uh, one view controller, uh, I will uh, split the content. I'll split the responsibilities among multiple view controllers. And then I'll use something similar to a child view controller approach. So I'll add one controller in a way like you add a sub view. I'll add the same way a controller on top of each other and have them handle specific responsibilities. Uh, and one of the examples is like, of course, there is an official guide for that, uh, for uh, making a custom view controller. But uh, there are already so uh, many of those controllers, like navigation controller is one of the examples and everyone use it, use, is using it. And split view controller is doing the same job and doing quite a lot of uh, work uh, by adapting the interface to the iPad and iPhone and split view on iPad. So uh, without even knowing what's the interface all about, it just has two controllers and coordinates between them. So I'll definitely go with this hierarchical controller approach. All right. Clear, let's go to the next one. So the weak and unowned keywords. So where are they used and what are they for? So uh, those keywords are related to the uh, uh, they are related to the memory management. So um, if I take a look for example on the UI table view uh, if I just go to the UI table view and uh, for example data source and delegate are both declared as weak uh, which means that it will not hold uh, a reference to the data source. Basically, mm, it will just use it, it will query it, but it will not hold the memory. So whenever the table view, uh, whenever the data source has no references outside, or if it doesn't have any, anything else, it will be deallocated. And it's usually uh, made so because the table view is a view, and that's why it has to have Let's say usually the controller provides the data, and that's why it has to have the delegate weekly held, otherwise we have this reference cycle. So usually the, uh, when the week is used, it's used during the uh, reference, uh, to break the reference cycles. And uh, unknown is very similar to weak, so in the fact that it doesn't add the uh, reference count, but um, so it will not hold the object strongly in memory, but uh, the difference is that it will not be declared as optional. So you, you, you use usually unknown salt, unknown salt when, when you're 100% sure that it will never be, uh, it will never be uh, nil and you just want to like work around the compiler to make it, uh, to make it, um, to make it a non-optional type so that you don't have to like unwrap it all the time and so forth. Mm -hmm. Usually you can use that in closures, for example, or yeah, if you, for example, refer to, uh, if you, for example, refer in the lazy uh, closures in the lazy variable, 
or uh, just an enclosure. You have to use either weak or unknown, so not to create a reference cycle. All right. Usually it's, used with, usually it's used with the delegates, like usually all of the delegates in Apple platforms, they are, uh, they are connected as weak. So they don't hold the, the object they are referring to strongly. So are there any exceptions when delegate is not held weakly? Yeah, yeah, there are some exceptions. For example, um, there's a, an SURL session, it's a very interesting case. Uh, the basic networking object on iOS or URL session as I'll just switch to the Swift version of it. And uh, session delegate, and the session delegate, which is basically an object that receives the events from the session, uh, it's a strong reference. So you create a session, you set a delegate, but the session will hold its delegate strongly. And this is important because it might have a memory leak uh, if you don't remember this specific case. And the task is very simple. I guess the intent was that you just instantiate um, this delegate and the session basically handles it. The, the, the only purpose of this delegate is to be held by the session. You don't really uh, need anywhere else. That's why it was designed that way probably. Because if the table view, if you think about table view, uh, the um, table is, table view is hold, held by the controller and the controller usually is a delegate. But in this case, like the session is the main object and the delegate is just a um, additional behavior that you want to customize. So that's why it's okay to hold it strongly. But this inconsistency is really actually quite tricky. And if you forget about that, it's really easy to, to, um, to make some problems in the app. All right. So always refer to the documentation, uh, whether it's a weakly or str uh, strongly held uh, property. Got it. Cool. How about the lazy keyword? When is that one helpful? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, lazy is basically lazy initialization. So that the let's let's take a look at this one. Uh, I'll find viewed it alone, for example, here for patient view control. I'll create something here. Lazy variable. Um, what what can it be? Um, another view. So, for example, you can use something to add like a customization here. So, uh, first of all, it's really convenient to have something customized. Um, like instead of, uh, if I were to create a let constant, let view two, view two, it would be, I have to have it like that. I have to have it like that. And then I have to use a view that load to configure it. But here I can just add all of the configurations here. And yeah, so the lazy one is used for uh, mainly for uh, mm, uh, calculating values that you might not need. For example, if you don't want to add another view all of the time, depending on the on some conditions. So like if uh, uh, random you uh, you add a view another view. So in this case. Uh, in some of the cases uh, when this would be a false, the another view will, will not only will be added to the uh, sub view, but it won't even be instantiated. So that will increase the performance of the of the app a bit. So that's one of the uh, cases. And um, another one is that you have some customization here available so that you can sort of add a tag and so forth. So it's really convenient to uh, to add something that you will otherwise have to write in the method, so to keep it close here. How about can the lazy keyword be used on the collection on collections? Like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be used on the collections too. Uh, so if I create an array, then I have to create lazy. It will produce the lazy sequence, and then when I have to when I execute a filter, it will. Um, Take it one by one, basically. So, or map. So it will not. Uh, it will not uh, go through each of those 
Uh, it will not execute the, the whole code for that, but it will execute it only when I need the values. So map, then map something else. If I do map like that to string, let me just try a string in it, then map and then double in it. And if I uh, take the first, uh, this will only um, take the first value out of this. It will not map those, it will not touch two, it will not touch three. So if you have a really, really huge collection, this will be quite efficient to use lazy on the collections. What if you remove the first, would it still go through all? What do you mean? If you remove the last method. The I, don't, I don't know, Pro uh, probably it should not go through any of those. Mm, okay. okay. Uh, I don't know. The only, no the only way. way, the only way is to run, I think. Going to ch check it out. So, probably it will be not even executed because it's just the, uh, because it's just like a unused result. But uh, let's see. I'm trying to figure out what this result is. So you can see it's lazy map sequence integer double. So what is this result? Lazy map sequence optional double, and the base sequence is three elements, right? So you have these three elements, one, two, three, which are here, and the transform, which is like combined function, which is probably a combination of everything here. And let's try to execute the first. So we're getting the double here, right? So it went through this. Mm -hmm. And let's print out the result again. Uh, yeah, so we have again. I'm not sure if it's actually caching, but uh, but as you can see, it didn't execute anything, but it will return you whenever you ask for it, whenever you ask for something. Okay. All right, so let's go to the closures and... I hope it's the last one. <laughs> Yeah, it is the last one. So awesome. closures, there's those two keywords that always kind of, as a beginner, kind of yeah. made it difficult to understand. And one of them is the escaping key keyword and the not escaping is the other one. Yep. Maybe there's another one as well, but I'm not sure. But can you tell me about what is an escaping closure? Yeah, sure. There is a, there is another one. Uh, order closure. Oh, what? Quite a lot. Order closure. But that's probably a different order closure. Uh, order closure. Yeah, but that's in a different video. So yeah, uh, I've added this this simple class here to uh, look at the escaping and no escape. So uh, the difference is really simple. Uh, if you so the fir first of all. Uh, the escaping parameter applies not only not really to the closure itself, uh, but to the closure as the parameter of the function. So, um, and and what it, what it says essentially is that you can uh, it tells compiler that you can store this closure in some variable. That's it, because if you uh, don't have this escaping modifier attribute. You, you will have to execute it only in the scope somewhere here in the function as the part. For example, all these UI view, UI kit, completion handlers, they are executed in the scope, so there are no escaping closures. Uh, and of course, you can execute the escaping closure here as well. There is nothing wrong with that. Uh, but if it's uh, a no, no escaping closure, you won't be able to assign it. So I'll just uncomment that and I'll get a warning. Assigning a non-escaping uh, parameter handler to an escaping closure, and if I try to, it's implicitly non-escaping. Uh, at some point in Swift, it used to be the other way around. So the default was uh, the default was escaping, and you had to add this no-escape attribute to um, change it. But if I fix it, it will basically add the escaping. Uh, and uh, not sure if I, if it still has no escape. No, it does not. So this one is removed. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, escaping is the one you can store in the variable. No escape 
is the one you can't, and, the, and it's no escape by default, as of Swift 5 something. Okay, so, like, are there any performance benefits if you kind of do uh, not as yeah, I think it has to do with the uh, performance uh, issues or with the performance optimizations, but I don't know uh, the details. All right. Cool, but yeah, that was all the questions I had, and I think you you know pretty well all of them, so you definitely passed the interview. That's good. That's <laughs> glad to hear. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, great job. Glad to hear. So yeah, uh, I guess that was it. And thank you, Dan, so much for assisting me and uh, grilling me through this interview. Uh, that was tough to say the least. And uh, hope our viewers enjoy no, this no. as well. <laughs> yeah, I'll put the links. I'll put the links to Dan' uh, social media or YouTube channel if you decide to start one. And uh, uh, I think it would be a good idea. So. Uh, cool. Yeah, hopefully that was entertaining. And uh, if you want to have some, to, if you want me to make some of the videos on any other topic, like um, different interview questions, just ask them in the comments below. I'll go through all of them. And uh, if there is something interesting, I'll definitely make a video with the with those questions and answers. So yeah, uh, good luck in learning iOS and uh, subscribe to my channel. That's where the uh, new content is going to be soon. Cool, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>